our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. And also with you. We have come into the presence of God who created us to love him and as his dear children. But we have disobeyed him and deserve only his wrath and punishment. Therefore, let us confess our sins to him and plead for his mercy. Merciful Father in heaven, I am altogether sinful from birth. In countless ways I have sinned against you and do not deserve to be called your child. But trusting in Jesus, my Savior, I pray, have mercy on me according to your unfailing love. Cleanse me from my sin and take away my guilt. God, our Heavenly Father, has forgiven all your sins. By the perfect life and innocent death of our Lord Jesus Christ, he has removed your guilt forever. You are his own dear child. May God give you strength to live according to his will. Amen. In the peace of forgiveness, let us praise the Lord by singing O Taste and See. of our Lord. We continue 
another angel coming up from the east who had the seal of the living God. He called out with a loud voice to the four angels who were given power to harm the earth and the sea. He said, Do not harm the earth, the sea, or the trees until we have placed a seal on the forehead of God's servants. And I heard the number of those seals. 144,000 seals from all the tribes of the people of Israel. From the tribe of Judah, 12,000 were sealed. From the tribe of Reuben, 12,000. From the tribe of Gad, 12,000. From the tribe of Asher, 12,000. From the tribe of Naphtali, 12,000. From the tribe of Manasseh, 12,000. From the tribe of Simeon, 12,000. From the tribe of Levi, 12,000. From the tribe of Issachar, 12,000. From the tribe of Zebulun, 12,000. From the tribe of Joseph, 12,000. From the tribe of Benjamin, 12,000 who were sealed. This is the word of our Lord. Hallelujah. Jesus Christ has destroyed death and brought life and immortality to life through the gospel. Hallelujah.
sometimes like this, to mark you as a redeemed child of God. If you guys want to check your parents' foreheads, or if you want to check each other's in your pew, do you see the mark on the forehead? Do you see a mark across there? You do? <laughs> you have pretty good eyesight then. I don't see it when I look in the mirror. I think as other people look at each other's foreheads, they don't see that mark that the pastor said. You see the sign of the mark the cross and the heart on the head and the heart to mark you as a child of God. It's invisible. Do you know what? It's still there. The mark is there. The seal is there to know that we are God's child, that we are saved. Isn't that wonderful to know that God has sealed us and we are saved all through baptism? Let's pray. Oh Lord, thank you for baptism. Thank you for marking, for stealing my forehead to know that I am yours now and always in heaven. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I ask the congregation to sing the last two stanzas of our hymn.
we get to heaven, I don't think we're going to see Jesus with a sword coming out of his mouth, literally. And whatever he speaks in his head, this sword is swinging with it. No, this sword is representing God's word. Elsewhere in scripture, it does tell us that God's word is sharper than any two-edged sword. And so we understand this picture. The second thing we need to understand is that the book of Revelation is about the end times era, the era that we are actually living in right now, as well as the last day, which is still yet to come. And the third thing we need to understand is that the book of Revelation, its focus, its theme, is all about giving comfort to believers as they go through the tribulation of this end times era. So we jump into our text now, and we see right away these four angels who had been given the power to destroy the earth and the sea, and yet they don't. They wait. Why should they wait? Why should they just let these destructive winds come and destroy the earth? Hasn't the earth gotten bad enough with the effects of sin, with these diseases, and with these natural disasters? Has the earth gotten bad enough with this general unbelief? This general turning away from the Lord and his word, along with just an outright opposition to him and his word. With all this going on, the earth should be destroyed. It's bad enough as it is. But they don't. Because an angel came and commanded them, do not harm the earth, the sea, or the trees until we have placed a seal on the foreheads of God's servants. And so these four angels, they're holding back these destructive winds while these other angels are going out, placing the seal of the living God on his servant's forehead. I'm pretty sure people like the book of Revelation. Well, first of all, because it's well, about what's he's still yet to come. And people are curious about that. But it's written in picture form, a way that we very much appreciate. We, we like to see we understand these pictures as part of our culture. We see this picture plenty of times in superhero movies and action films, don't we? This wall, this ceiling, or something else going to come and, and crash and collapse on a roof. And yet a, a brave, strong hero steps up and holds back of that wall, holds back the ceiling or whatever is about to come and, and crush them. He holds it back just long enough for the group to escape in safety. And then he lets it go, and it, and it crushes and destroys whatever's left there. Because we understand this picture, we understand what these angels are doing, don't we? They're holding back these destructive winds, waiting for the other angels to seal in safety all the servants of God. And then they'll let it, the winds of destruction go to destroy the world at that time. Another nice thing about the book of Revelation is that all the doctrine in Revelation is found elsewhere in Scripture. In fact, this very scene is described by Jesus in, in one of his parables from a slightly different perspective. The parable goes like this. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while everyone is sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. When the wheat sprouted and formed heads, then the weeds also appeared. The owner's servants came and to him and said, Sir, didn't you sow good seed in your field? Where then did the weeds come from? An enemy did this, he replied. The servants asked him, Do you want us to go and pull them up? No, he answered, because while you are pulling up the weeds, you may uproot the weeds with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. At that time, I will tell the harvesters, collect the weeds and tie them in bundles to be burned. Then gather the wheat and bring it into my barn. Do you get it? Do you understand the parable? Let me tell the parable again, but with its meaning this time. God has given faith to believers here on earth. But his enemies, whether it is the devil, the world, or the sinful nature, has made sure that there are still unbelievers in this world. These two, they, they are both in this world together, but yet they should be distinguishable among each other because believers should have acts of faith that they show. 
So while the while the unbelievers should have a lack of faith or a lack of action by faith, and so the question was brought up: Should we wipe out the unbelievers? God said no. He didn't want that to happen because he was afraid that while the unbelievers were being wiped out, that perhaps maybe some of the believers would also be wiped out. God doesn't want any casualties. He doesn't want any losses of his believers. No matter how small the ratio may be, even if it's a one to a hundred or a thousand or a billion, he doesn't want that one believer to perish, to be ripped up, to be wiped out with the unbelievers. And so he said, wait, wait to the last day, and there all believers will be taken into the safety of heaven, and the unbelievers will be thrown into the fire of hell. And so we circle back to our question yet again, don't we? Why not have the end come right now? Why shouldn't God just bring the end and end our suffering here on earth and bring us to the safety of heaven? The earth is bad enough as it is. The earth is heathen enough as it is. It should happen now. I bet the believers during the world wars were thinking the same thing. Why should God end the world now in the early 1940s? But if God did that, if God ended the world in the early 1940s, none of us would have been born. None of us would believe. As bad as diseases are now, as bad as this COVID is, I get the feeling that the Europeans would have thought that the Black Death in the mid-1300s was way worse. They probably want the world to come to an end at that time, too. But if God ended the world in the, the mid-1300s, then no one here on Earth would exist. None of us would have the chance to, to believe. Think about the worst it has ever gotten on this world. The most even it has ever gotten during Noah's time. I mean, eight believers versus a whole world of unbelievers. When God completely destroyed the earth during Noah's time, then think of the billions of billions of billions of believers. that had the chance to even come to faith and believe. God waited through the flood, waited through the black death, waited through the world wars for you to be born, for you to believe, for you to be saved. And God is still waiting now for all believers, for the whole Christian to be born and to come to faith and believe in him. Once that happens, once the whole Christian church has arrived, then God will destroy the world. After all, God is waiting because he doesn't want even one stalk of wheat to be pulled up with the wheat. God is waiting for all of his servants to be sealed in safety. We hear that this is going to be a lot of people. Our text even says 144,000. With so many being sealed, do you think it's possible that maybe one person would be overlooked, would be passed by or forgotten? I mean, we do this all the time with our grocery list, don't we? I mean, I do at least. I make a list even. I go to the store. I buy what I need. I check out. Then I go home and to find out I forgot something. In fact, I did this this past week with a list of five things. I still forgot one. With 144,000 that are to be sealed, it would be understandable to us if perhaps one would be overlooked, would have been passed by, not sealed. We would understand that unless that one is you or your loved one, do you really want to take that chance that you have been overlooked, passed by, or forgotten to be sealed? Well, the number 144,000 gives us comfort <coughs> that the whole Christian church will be sealed. 
come to the book of Revelation in the vision. And so the details are not to be taken literally, but symbolically. The number 144,000 is to be taken symbolically, not literally. Because in the book of Revelation, even the numbers have their own meaning. And these are the numbers that we're dealing with. Three. Three means God. Think of the triune God, the three persons of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We're dealing with the number four, like the four corners of the earth. Four is people of this world. And three and four, they make twelve. Twelve is God's covenant with his people. It's his people. We also have the number ten, which is the number of break down this 144,000 now. 12, 12, 10, 10, 10. 12, the number of God's people, and there's two of them, the Old Testament and the New Testament era. And then there's these three tens, meaning completeness, or really a, a godly completeness. And so we come to the conclusion that 144,000 means the whole Christian church. It's all believers of all time. There's a few more details that tips us off that 144,000 is to be taken symbolically and not literally in our text. We see that in the names of the tribes, something just isn't quite right with them. You look at the names and you realize that this list has never been given in this way before in this order. Part of that is because these tribes have never been grouped together in this way. If they wanted the sons of Jacob, then Manasseh should be taken out, as that is actually Jacob's grandson, and Dan put in his place. If they wanted the tribes of Israel, then Levi should be taken out, because they were never a actual tribe, but a people set aside by God as his priests. And then Joseph should also be taken out. Because he was never a tribe, but his two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim, were put as the tribes of Israel. And so we should need to include Ephraim in here, as well as Dan, as I mentioned before. Because of this, these tribe names just don't add up to take this 144,000 literally, but symbolically. And then if we're to continue into verse 9, we see that 144,000 is just too small of a number for all these people to be sealed in safety. Verse 9 goes like this. I, that is the apostle John, looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count, from every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands. A great multitude that no one could count. I know 144,000 is a large number, but we can count that. And then this group is supposed to be from every nation, tribe, people, and language. That's supposed to be just this 144,000. But yet, by looking back in, in scriptures, we see that the Israelites, the male Israelites alone as they left Egypt, minus the tribe, or minus the people of the Levites, totaled 603,550. That's over four times the amount of 144,000. And that is just one people of one language, of one race at one time. There's no way for this 144,000 to be literal. It must be taken symbolically as the whole of Christian church being sealed. And you can have comfort in knowing that you have not been overlooked, passed by, or forgotten by God because you are a sheep of the Good Shepherd. And this is what Jesus has to say about his sheep. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. 
No one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. God knows each of the sheep. God knows you. You have not been forgotten by him. And if you need further comfort, look towards your baptism. Your baptism in which a physical washing accompanied God washing you of your sin. Baptism in which the Holy Spirit worked faith and not strengthened the faith in your heart. Baptism in which God placed his name on you, adopting you as his child. Baptism, right before which the pastor said, we see the sign of the cross on the head and on the heart to mark you as a redeemed child of God. I'll say it again. The sign, the seal is invisible, but it is still there. We are just waiting now for the whole Christian church to be sealed. The Christian church has been waiting for the whole Christian church, for all believers to believe for almost 2,000 years now. And the Christian church will continue to wait until all believers are born and until they all believe. I, for one, am grateful and glad that God waited this long so that I could be born and believe. And I am excited to see what other believers that are going to be sealed still Please stand as we confess our faith together using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated as we continue. Um, well, as we normally continue by worshiping God for our offerings, at this time we're not passing the offering plates around, but you can still worship God with your offerings by either having put your offering in the basket in the plate already or on your way out. But since this is a spiritual act of worship, we're going to also sing our offertory hymn, We Give Thee But Thy Own. the whole 
home of our nation by your spirit, be husbands and wives to love each other, parents to nurture their children, young adults to assume responsibility, and children to show respect. And here at Florida, we bring you our private petition.
comfort us in all temptation, and bestow on us your saving peace. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Brothers and sisters, go in peace, live in harmony with one another, and serve the Lord with gladness. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you, be gracious to you. The Lord look on you in favor and give you peace.
we want to keep going forward with our restrictions that we place for ourselves in worship. Uh, more on that during our meeting. Uh, just a reminder, we're still doing our Zoom Bible study. It'll be on Tuesday evening at 7 when we're able to meet. If you're interested, let me know. I can send you that invite over email. And just to let you know, I will be on vacation July 6th to the 13th. If there's any questions about church matters, uh, please contact Rich Nickerson. His number is found in the bulletin, as well as his wife's number in case he doesn't pick up and you still need to get to him. Um, if there is a pastoral concern, um, he is able to get a hold of a pastor for you, if not myself. So, um, with that, we are ready. Let's see if the volume, the sound works. President Mark Schrader. Wells Christian Aid and Relief is a lifeline for those in extraordinary need, but it's also an opportunity for us to put our Christian faith into action, showing Jesus' love to strangers who might soon become our brothers and sisters in Christ. When disaster strikes, Wells Christian Aid and Relief mobilizes to organize volunteers, people like Janella and her family, who canceled their vacation so they could be here. Showing Christ's love to those in need after a tornado devastated this community. Well, we're supposed to serve our neighbors. We have been called to serve as the well. People um, have had so many troubling times when they just can't protect themselves and can't do this by themselves. So we, we Christians, stand up for them in times of need. Disaster relief efforts like this one in Panama City, Florida, have a twofold purpose. We begin by helping people with their immediate needs, and those efforts naturally build relationships that give us an opportunity to share our Christian faith. And so we find that as we show Christ's love to people, a lot of times they're interested in learning more. Sometimes they visit our services, we build a connection with them, and we get to tell them about Jesus. Volunteers also help repair hurricane damage to our church in Panama City. And services have now resumed. Today, the church is a beacon of Christ's love in a community that was once broken. God's love has shined through, and all the volunteers who came really built these people up. Christian aid and relief depends on individuals like you who can help identify those in need. So, even if there isn't a natural disaster in your area, perhaps there are victims of a house fire or a person with major medical bills. Keep your eyes and ears open. Is there a member in need? Are you going to reach out to them as a congregation? Come and talk to us. We can assist your local efforts. 